Amen. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. Let's show the Lord some love. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for being an amazing God, so incredible, so amazing. Pray your blessing now over the powerful, relevant, specifically addressing every need, Word of God. Use this vessel as you see fit to bring you much glory. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's show the Lord some love wherever you are. Bless you. Amen. Amen. I am excited to see that we are continuing looking at the book of Ezra. And so by way of review, and this is so important that we do that, I hope we know that Ezra is the author of Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah are what we have talked about is this continuous flow of the Jews' captivity in Babylon moving to their return to their homeland in Jerusalem and the rebuilding of their city and their temple. So in the book of Ezra, we've learned that the Persian king by the name of Cyrus who conquered Babylon is actually the first piece to God's puzzle we find in this book. And he released the Jews from 70 years of captivity in Babylon so that they could return to their homeland and rebuild in Jerusalem. Then we looked at a second piece on God's puzzle board. In Ezra, we looked at Haggai, and Haggai, whose message about God's unfinished house, contrasting their finished homes, was God's way to motivate Zerubbabel, the politician, Joshua, the 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 priests, and also the people to motivate all of them to do something, to finish rebuilding the Lord's house. So we also looked at in this as we've been going through these pieces, we are now at this fourth piece, which is on God's puzzle board in Ezra and is focused on establishing worship for the returning Jews. So we had the first piece was King Cyrus. The second piece on the puzzle board was Zerubbabel. And he led the 42 to 50,000 returning Jews to rebuild the temple. Then the third piece was Haggai. And uh, he was sent to motivate Zerubbabel, the politician, Joshua, the priest, and the people to finish rebuilding the house of God. And then the fourth piece on the puzzle board is where we are today, and that fourth piece is Ezra. He's the author, again, of Chronicles, the author of, uh, the author of Ezra, and the author of Nehemiah. So what was his focus? His focus was on establishing or re-establishing worship for these returning Jews. So turn with me to Ezra chapter 7, and we'll, we'll read verses 6 through 10. So we'll read verse 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 as we look at Ezra. 
The Bible says in verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylon and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all he requested because of what the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. And I would hope that this is how God would view me and be able to say the hand of the Lord is upon him. Verse 7, some of the sons of Israel and some of the priests, the Levites, the singers, that's my group, the singers. I would be in that group, the singers. The gatekeepers and the temple servants went up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. He came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king, for on the first of the first month, he began to go up to Babylon, and on the first of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem because the good, notice this, hand of his God was upon him. Wow. He was a man that loved God. And I pray that the Lord would have that kind of perspective upon me. I pray that my life would grow to where it would be to where the good hand of the Lord is upon me, and that would be God's perspective, not yours, but God's. There's a lot of people that say, man, the hand of God is upon so-and-so, and the hand of God may be so far from them, it would be like they are in New York and God is in California. This is what God is saying in verse 10. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do what? And to practice it. He was a doer of the word and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. You may be seated. So this first piece, King Cyrus, we looked at. Second piece is a rubber bell. Third piece, Haggai, now Ezra. Let's begin with Israel escalating, escalating history. Israel's history reveals escalating punishment for their sins. And notice this, that God would send nations to raid them. That was one level of escalation like the Philistines escalating. He would send nations to raid them, and they would lose what? Property. They would raid and take, and that was a level of escalation. Then the Lord would also send drought and famine. We see that in the Bible, and they would lose food. Their, their food source would be decimated or or severely impacted, and they would lose food. God would escalate even more from time to time and send disease. That was an escalation, and they would now begin to lose their health. And we know how important our health is to us. We, in America, we spend billions of dollars on various things for our health, vitamins and medicines and oils and gluten-free and, and, and low-carb and all of these things. And so we know how important our health is, and God would even escalate to impact their health because of their sin. But there was something that happened that, that really showed that God had had enough with his people. And that is when God sent conquest, when God first sent the Assyrians to conquer the northern tribes. And when people say that those are ten tribes of Israel, they were the northern tribes that were divided. 
you know, after Solomon, they were divided into these two kingdoms, ten to the north, two to the south, and so this is where they live. One capital was Samaria, one was Jerusalem, and so this is where they resided, they resided, and God sent the Assyrian to escalate to conquest, and they and the Assyrians they they conquered the, these ten northern tribes and they took them off into a level of captivity. And then the Babylons came and they conquered the Assyrians and that's where we hear about the Babylonian captivity. And when they conquered the Assyrians, then they came and finished them off. And the last two tribes, they conquered them and carried them off into 70 years of, of captivity. So they lost not only their property, they lost not only food, they lost not only their health now, they lost their freedom and what the cherished promised land. Wow, I want to read to you in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15 through 21, what happened to God's people when he had enough. He said, enough is enough when his people were tripping. And I submit to you today, if you are tripping, God has plans to get you where you need to be. For young people out there, if you tripping, God has a plan to get you where you need to be. And that's why you have 25 dudes, 25 ladies, ladies, and they rolling deep somewhere they ain't supposed to be. It's normally the believer that gets caught. Everybody else gets away, but it's the one that's been in and out of church, children's church, this church, preschool ministry, all that. They the ones that get caught. Why? Because God loves you and he's escalating so that he can save you. Wow, 2 Chronicles 36, 15 through 21. Let's see what happens when God's people start tripping. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again and again and again. It's like back in the day. This don't happen today, but, but you with your brothers and sisters and cousins and, and friends and, and you cutting up and you acting up and your mama back in the day or your daddy and they look at you and they say, calm down. And you still acting up again and again and again, and they look at you. But then there's this one time when they throw them eyes on you. And what they really say, I had enough. Enough is enough is enough. I've told you again and again and again and again. So when we get home, it's going to be on like Donkey Kong. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers because he had what? Compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Why did he wait that long? Because he had compassion. But they continually mocked the messengers of God. <laughs> Mama sent somebody outside to tell you, you know, it came back in the house, he was out there cussing. Mama sent word, said, stop cussing. You ain't paying no attention to that messenger, the next messenger, the next messenger, the next messenger. And finally, mama heard you cuss. But they continue to mock the messengers of God, despise his words, and they scoff at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, until there was no remedy. God said, I had enough. Therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young men or virgin or old men or those that are infirm. Wow. America's a young nation, 240-something years old. America has never known conquest. Nobody has never rolled in America and conquered us. We don't understand conquest. We understand conquering, but not conquest. And during conquest, those that win, they get to do whatever they want to do with you. That means that they were killing the young men. That means that they were taking the virgins and the women, making them their own. That means that they took them back to Babylon. That means they lost their freedom. That means they lived in captivity. All of that happened because God had had enough. 
Wow, he gave them all into his hand, all the articles of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord. Remember, Solomon built this first temple, and it was a glorious, expensive uh, temple. He spared no cost. It was expensive with all this expensive treasures that was in there. They took it all. Not only all of that, but the Bible goes on to say the treasures of the king and of his officers that would be like America being conquered and they come through our homes and they take all of that we have. And, and, and don't get me wrong, if they come to my house, they're going to be mad. They're going to say, that's all Pastor Mike got. That's all we got up in there. They're going to be mad. They're going to probably beat me half to death. You ain't got no more. Say, yeah, I ain't got a whole lot. But some of y'all big ballers out there. They're going to have a good time in your house. Some of them are going to say, listen, hey, 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 I'm, I, got like, I got like 200 pairs of shoes to give to my lady. I got all this jewelry and all that, and, and go in the garage and all them expensive cars. We've never known conquest, so we never know what it felt like to come and conquer us and take all of our stuff. When God had enough, he had enough took everything. You said, well, surely that was enough. Nah. Then they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. Why was that so significant? When you read Nehemiah, you find out the wall was for security. They broke down the wall. That's why Nehemiah went back to build the wall and burned all its fortified buildings with fire and destroyed all of their valuable articles. You say, what's those? That's the artifacts. That's the stuff that, that, that money can't buy. Those are the pictures that you had from when your great-great-grandma was there. That's all of the china that was passed on from generation. That's all of the, all of the old jewelry. That, that's, that's the old ring. That's the wedding dress that your mama gave you. That's all that stuff that you cannot replace. What happened to the Jews when the, when, when, when the Germans came and took all of their stuff? That's what happened to them. They took all of their stuff, any values, any artifact, took it all. But watch this. Those who escaped from the sword, those who didn't die, those who didn't kill, didn't, didn't get killed, he carried away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and to all, all his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. Notice what we've been studying. The Babylonians took him for 70 years. King Cyrus, that's after they conquered Babylon. And so it was all the way for those 70 years until now we get to the point of where we are and we again talked about the first three pieces. Now let's look at Ezra, Ezra's piece. Ezra's piece, if we summed it up, it would just be this. Ezra's piece was to bring revival or renewal. Because here's the deal. From the time that Zerubbabel went back to Jerusalem and to Ezra, it's been 80 years, and it's been 60 years since they built the temple. So they had 60 years to learn how to worship. Some people say, well, I don't understand that. I don't understand how our people can't worship. They had 60 years to get it right in worship. They thought that the building is what determined worship. They didn't know worship was a matter of the heart. Their hearts wasn't right. They wasn't living for God. And so Ezra came. And so Ezra chapter 1 through 6 we went through that. It's focused on Zerubbabel, the politician, and primarily about construction. Now Ezra chapter 7 begins to focus on Ezra, the scribe and the priest, who went to establish true worship. And verse 7 identifies the worship team that we just read that was traveling with him. What was his, wor his worship team to restore worship? It was the priests, the Levites, the singers. I'm in that group. I'm in the singers group. I'm in the, I'm in the George Powell group. I'm in the Vincent Powell group because when I get to heaven, I'm going to sing just like them or better. So that's the group that I want to be in. The priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, the temple servants went up, the Bible said, to Jerusalem. And you know what that shows us? When you look and deconstruct what's going on here, you need a multi-layered level of involvement for worship. You need ushers. 
You need a parking team. You need somebody taking care of restrooms. You need somebody vacuuming. You need somebody on windows. You need somebody on this. You need somebody. You need a multi-layered environment in order to get it done. This is the worship team that he brought with him. And so before Christ, God's presence dwelt in the temple complex. We're saved. The indwelling spirit lives in us. But prior to Christ, his presence dwelt in the temple complex and was a place to worship God. However, after building the second temple, remember the first temple, it was destroyed by, by the Babylonians. Solomon's temple was destroyed. And now the second temple, and this temple for 60 years, they didn't know how to worship. There's people today that don't know how to worship. They think, they think worship is like singing, moving. They think worship is like how you move. They, they don't really understand worship. They don't understand that worship has always been a matter of the heart. And so here Ezra come. It's 60 years after the temple what was a built. He's trying to teach them how to worship. And worship has always been connected to obedience. Always. Always. Go back to Adam and Eve. Worship was connected to what? Obedience. When they disobeyed, they interrupted what? The worship experience with God, and God dealt with them. You cannot have true worship without an obedient life. If you're living in rebellion, you're not worshiping God. Wow. Wow. You say, well, I don't believe that, Pastor. Show me that in the Bible. The Bible says obedience is always better than sacrifice. You say, wow, 1 Samuel 15, 20 and 23. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on a mission on which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agag, the king of, of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, and that's just like a poor leader, he's blaming the people and not his leadership on the situation. So here we go. And Samuel said, but the people took some of the spoil. Uh, um, uh, Saul said that, I mean, excuse me, the spoil, uh, uh, the sheep, the oxen, and the choices of the things devoted to, destru uh, to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Now watch this. They wasn't sacrificing to the Lord their God with that stuff. They took that for themselves. This is just a fraud. And watch what Samuel said. Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in your offerings, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your, you know, what you give? as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Notice what he said, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. And watch this, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Talking about King Saul, and here's the deal. We got to realize there is no worship without obedience, and when you are living in rebellion, and this is for the young people out there. When you are living in rebellion, the Bible says that rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. It is like you are bowing down and worshiping the devil. It's like idolatry. Idolatry is worshiping the devil. Any idolatry is worshiping the enemy. And all forms of rebellion is like that. And that's the reason why all these shows on TV, especially Nickelodeon, and all these shows where they have these actors that are playing bad kids for us to laugh. That's not funny. That, that new show, Kid Dylan, Kid, Kid Dylan, and stuff like that, them shows where those kids are being smart-mouthed and bad, that's not funny. Rebellion in the Bible is never seen as a joke. It's a joke today. If you got a smart mouth kid in your house and you laugh at that smart mouth kid, you are out of order if you a believer. The Bible says that rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. It's like you are bowing down and worshiping the devil. That's not a laughing matter. 
You got a smart mouth kid in the house where you and your husband and y'all just laugh and friends come over and, and, and they embarrass you and you just laughing because you, you know, you, you embarrassed, but you still trying to play it off and laughing and stuff like that. All you doing is charging that kid up. You putting, you, you are gassing that kid up to continue to rebel. It's not a laughing matter. Rebellion is not a laughing matter. And if you're living in rebellion, the Bible says that you cannot worship. Wow. So what about worshiping the Word of God? Worshiping the Word. Ezra came with a worship team to establish a system of true worship. What was that system of true worship? According to verse 10, it was centered on the Word of God. The Bible says, for Ezra has set his heart to what? To study what? The law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. It is about the Word of God. You want to show me any true worship experience? It is centered around the Word of God, and that's the reason why gospel music that is not about the Word of God is not what God desires. If gospel music is false and teaches things that are against the Word of God, that you're going to be rich that you guaranteed to be healed and all this other kind of stuff money coming this coming that coming that does not honor God at all worship is supposed to be centered around the Word of God and all this stuff to make us want to jump and move and spin and flip and all of that kind of stuff if it's based on the Word of God praise him but if it's based on just emotion God is not with it Wow Wow the Bible says Ezra set his heart he set his heart, that meant what? That meant he fixed his heart towards something that became his objective in life. What was that something? He fixed his heart towards to study. He fixed his heart to practice the Word of God. He, pricks, he, 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 he fixed his heart to teach the Word of God. His heart was on the Word of God. Like in Psalms 1 and 2, the Bible says this, that his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night there is something about falling in love with the Word of God that's what's missing today there's not enough of falling in love with the Word of God we fall in love with preachers all over this country folk fall in love with preachers you know, and I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with that in the sense of, you know, yeah, you ought to love them, but you ought not be worshiping no preacher. Folks say, I, 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 just, I, I, just, I just love this preacher. I just love this singer. I just love this, this, this prophetess or this prophet. I just love them, love them, love them. Are you going to fall in love with the Word of God the same way? Are you going to fall in love with the Word of God? You see, when we set our hearts towards God's Word, like Ezra, in verse 10, and like the psalmist, God promises something for us. This is what he promises when we set our hearts towards the, with the Word of God. It says, we, we will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Wow. Which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And, when, and, and whatever he does, the Bible says he prospers. When we fix our hearts on God's Word, it becomes our delight that we meditate on it day and, day and night. And this is how we become firmly planted strong trees. We begin to yield fruit. We don't wither and we prosper through every season of life. You want to prosper through the seasons of life? You fall in love with the Word of God. You fall in love with everything else. When you're going to fall in love with the Word of God? And during seasons like this, where we get daily barrages of unsettling news every time I turn on the news. My spirit can be high, and it's like it's unsettled after I watch it. You know, the only strength I find during this season is fixing my heart on the Word of God. I find absolutely no strength in watching the news. None. It is unsettling. We've got to fix our hearts on the Word of God. There are some times that I go into that study in my house, and all I want to do is just read the Word of God and study the Word of God because there's so much noise, and everybody's talking, and everybody's giving their opinion, do this, do that. It gets tiring, and all I can do is draw my strength from the Word of God. During this season, I don't get one ounce of strength at all from politicians. 
I've not listened to one politician since this all went down, and I got strength. Not one. I've not listened to one scientist and got no strength. Not at all. I've not listened to any medical professional and got no strength. My strength, the Bible says, my help comes from where? It comes from the Lord. That's where my strength comes from. It comes from the Lord. And how do I know more about the Lord? I read the Word of God. I've never studied like this in my life. COVID-19 has sent me to the Word of God over and over and over and over again. I ain't getting no help from the news. I ain't getting no help from politicians and medical officials and scientists. My strength comes from the Lord. You better ask somebody. And for some, if you lost, your strength comes from politicians. If you don't know Jesus, that's where it comes from. If you don't know Jesus, you, you, yeah, 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 your strength comes from scientists. If you don't know Jesus, yeah, your strength comes from medical professionals. Yeah, that's where your strength comes from. But if you know Jesus, oh, if you know Jesus, the Bible says your strength is supposed to come from the Lord and his word. Man, I wish I had some more time. I don't. But we'll pick up next week with Ezra. But I'll tell you right, right, right now, I know where my strength comes from. It comes from the Lord. That's why I spend my time in the Word of God more now than ever before. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let us pray. Father, we bless your name. We bless your name. We need you. We need more of you. Less of all this chatter. Everybody has an opinion about what's going on. Everybody. People that don't have degrees got opinions. People that ain't even been to, they, they, they ain't even studying school, they, they got opinions. People that don't even know nothing about science or, or medicine, they, they, they got opinions. Every, everybody has an opinion. We hear from athletes, entertainers. We hear from all sorts of people. Man, but I pray we'll hear from you, God. We need strength now. Ministry must go on. Lives still need to be changed, and your people need to hear from you. Speak to us, Lord. Drive us to the Word of God. Drive us to our knees. Fall on your knees. Drive us to our knees, O oh God, to depend on you. Drive us, drive us, drive us, drive us. Drive us to our knees. Drive us to the Word of God. Father, I pray if there's anybody that don't know the Lord as their Savior, pray right now, this is your moment. There was a time that I didn't know Jesus. Somebody shared with me that, that and brought to my attention that I was a sinner, and I realized I was, and that Jesus died for my sins. And that, that night, that person led me in a, a prayer to where I called on Jesus to save me. And I was rescued that night. That night I was rescued. If you want to do that, acknowledge and know that you're a sinner like the rest of us. Jesus died for your sins. And you want to receive him as your savior. The Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've done that, you're a believer, you're saved, make sure you call us. It's important that you be disciple, and we want to do that. We want to help you. You don't even have to be a member of our church, but we want to help you call us. Others, it may be a season for you to recommit or rededicate your life to the Lord. Now is your moment. Do that. Do that. Make this a priority moment. Get your, right, your, your, your life right with God. Do that. Call on him. Repent. Turn back to him. Then others, I pray, would commit to be a part of our church family, be a e-church, so that they can experience this Fallbrook experience in Christ. 
Christ first, Farbrook is just a mechanism that Christ uses his local churches to help us to get better. If God is calling you to be a part of our church family, let us know. Call us, email us, whatever you need to do, do that. God loves you. So, Father, we thank you for these moments of invitation. Pray that these moments might be special. Pray your blessing over those that have heard the word of God. May we be better, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Let's show the Lord some love. Amen, 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 amen.